Well, let's open our worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as we continue with our Easter journey, just remember how much God loves us as we listen to the prelude and send our thoughts this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, let us sing our songs of joy to the Lord. We will tell of God's power and victorious love. Let our voices be heard everywhere. Let all the earth echo the songs of God's mighty love. Let us feel the strength of God's forcing through us. Shout the good news. Christ is alive. Christ calls us. Praise be to God. Now, if you're able, will you please stand and join us in the opening hymn, Majesty, Worship His Majesty, page 176 in your hymnal. <laughs> Our 
scripture reading for today comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we will have the children's song.
Would you be in an attitude of prayer with me this morning? Gracious Lord, we just thank you for getting us up and going on another day that you have pro provided for us. And Lord, I just ask that you give a special dose of your spirit to us to open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear the message that you have for us this day. And Father, for myself, just empty me out of myself and fill me up with your spirit so the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> okay, I have a question for everybody. This is audience participation today. How many of you have had that wonderful opportunity of having your picture taken and maybe think back in the old school days when they had these things called flash bulbs? Do you ever have, have that taken? Yeah, a hand or two, right? And what happens immediately after they take that picture? Maybe once, or, yeah. You see, I, I see people going like this. You see all these little sparklies and little dots all around because you can't see. You were blinded by the light of that flash, right? Yeah, I see a lot of smiles. So, you know, I, I know that people have had that, that opportunity. And it even takes it a while for those spots to kind of go away and diminish. And especially if, oh, we got to take two or three of them. And you're constantly seeing that flash going off and, and kind of blinding you by that light. Well, that's kind of like our story this morning with Saul, except it's just a tiny bit. We got our sight back pretty pretty well and, and pretty fast from those flashing bulbs. But imagine an experience where, where we went through the more than just that tiny bit of what Saul did. Imagine an experience where you couldn't see for a prolonged period of time because of that blinding light that was there. Now, I know most of us have heard this story before, and this story is about how God got the attention of Saul and made that dramatic change in his life. It's not a long story that we're going to go over, but as we do, we'll take a time to tie it into our message from last week as well about being witnesses and the importance about being a witness for Jesus. So let's start with the very first word of our scripture reading for, from today. It started with the word, meanwhile. So when we hear this word, we know that there's something else going on, some sort of a tie-in to other events, don't we? When you hear like the, the phrase, meanwhile, back at the farm, you, you, know, you kind of get this picture, an activity's going on here, but at the same time, something else was going on somewhere else. So when our passage begins, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats and with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers, we know that something else was going on in that same story at the exact same time. So let's put this into a little bit of context. In Acts chapter 8, we're reminded that Stephen had just been stoned and he was being mourned by those that were around him and his disciples and and his followers at that time. And, and additionally, at that time, a great persecution broke out amongst the church in Jerusalem. We know that the, the church leaders just did not like this Jesus fellow and thought that once they put him to death, that that would be a once and a done situation and everybody would go back to following them rather than following uh, Jesus through God. And so Saul was actually going from house to house, dragging out those followers of the way, as it was called back then, and dragging them into, Christ, into prisons. And believers were kind of scattering about. They weren't staying in Jerusalem. They were, and they began preaching, though, about Jesus. They weren't keeping quiet. Even though Saul was pursuing them, they weren't keeping quiet. They were talking to others about Jesus and the impact that Jesus had in their life. So we look at Philip who went to Samaria and, and he was preaching the word and the story of the sorcerer is told in Acts chapter 8. And we also see the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and, was, and we're told how the Holy Spirit opened up the scriptures to Philip and allowed him to preach in a way that the Ethiopian would understand and eventually baptizes the man. 
And then that chapter 8 ends with, Philip, however, appeared at Azutis and traveled about preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Caesarea. And then we get to today, today's passage. Meanwhile, in other words, where all this other stuff, all this spreading of, of Jesus and preaching of him was going on, it still said Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So what kind of a picture does that paint for you? In my mind, I see a man whose face is probably pretty scowly and, and, and contorted and furrowed and, and just scowling all the time. And maybe even had that proverbial steam coming out of his ears because, man, he was mad. Oh, how dare these people, you know, not, not to follow the exact letter of the law that the, the, the leading Pharisees had sent out. And yet they're following this guy named Jesus. Still, after we put him to death, they're still following. How dare thee? Certainly not a pretty picture, is it? And remember here that Saul is a Pharisee. In fact, when he, later when he becomes Paul, he, in one of his letters, he said that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he was a, a higher ranking Pharisee, even among his order. And so Pharisees were not exactly the biggest champions of Jesus, were they? I mean, after all, they were the ones that called for him to be crucified. And so Saul decided to go through the high priest's office, who happened to be Caiaphas at that time, to get his blessing on his mission to go out and destroy all these followers. I'm going to rid these people once and for all for you, Caiaphas. And that's kind of what he had told him. And he received the letter and support that he could take with him to the various churches. And so he was on his way to the synagogue in Damascus to, with this letter so that he had this support that said, yes, you can go and imprison all these people and put them to death if you want. Anyone who encounter, he encountered along the way on, to, on that Damascus route belong, who belonged to the way, or in other words, a follower of Jesus, was taken prisoner, male, female. It didn't matter to him. Get them all, round them all up, and let's put them in prison. And if you follow the disciples of Jesus of Nazareth at all, you would be a target. You would be arrested. And so as he approached that city of Damascus, it says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. And you can think about that blinding flashlight bulb uh, going off around it. And, and oh, gosh, my eyes were blinded by that camera, except at a much bigger scale. And think of it this way, in Acts chapter 22, Paul revealed that this happened at midday when the sun was shining at its brightest. And yet Paul said that the light was brighter than the sun. Now, can you imagine the enormity of this flash or this brilliant light that just shone right there in front of him? And what was Saul's response to that overwhelming light that he just saw? Well, verse 4 tells us he fell to the ground. Now, do you think that was in worship to God? Or do you think because he was scared and frightened and didn't know what was going on? Uh, probably the last one, right? Uh, that he was doing that. He fell to the ground out of his own self-preservation. He was terrified of what was going on, and so he dropped in order to protect himself and from that light coming from heaven. And then on top of it all, he heard a voice calling him by name. Not only was he called by name, but he was asked a question that was pretty accusatory at that time. The voice started off, Saul. Saul! And you remember that we've talked about this before where anywhere a word or a phrase is repeated in the scripture that it's, we're supposed to take special note of that. It means pay attention, you readers. And again it said, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
Now, I think I might have been a little bit of a scared side myself if I heard that voice and after being blinded by a light. What about you? Would you be scared too? Probably so. And Saul realized that this voice was a voice of God. And so he realized that while he thought he was serving God by taking care of all these Christians, so to speak, he now knew that he was actually fighting against God. And so he knew that wasn't exactly a good thing. So to answer the question he was asked, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul replied with a question of his own. Who are you, Lord? Now the term used here for Lord, the word Lord, did not necessarily mean God or Jesus in this context, but it was a term of respect or reverence. Uh, they would even call you know, the Roman leaders Lord because you know, they kind of lorded it over them, right? So it was a term of a, a respect or, or supposed respect for something. And he just didn't know what was going on. So he knew someone more powerful than him had just blinded him by that light. And given that giant turn of events that had just occurred, it's no wonder that he'd used that term. And then he heard that voice explain who he was. I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. Now, I wonder what the first thought that went through Saul's mind at that time was. Did he think, oh no, now what? What's going to happen to me now? Now, he didn't have to ponder long, though, because the voice went on to tell him, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Wow. Wow. First of all, you've been blinded by a light, you're, you're struck down, you can't see, and yet you're told, uh, just keep going into the city and somebody's going to be there to tell you what to do. Wow. You can't see, you're fumbling along your way or along the road. But of course, there's more to this story as well, isn't there? The text goes on to tell about what happens next, but we're going to stop here today and ponder a little bit about that question raised by Saul. Who are you, Lord? So remember, last week we talked about being witnesses for God. And so if we were to be witnesses for God, for our Father, and especially to Jesus Christ, His Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit, do you suppose it might be an important question to ask, who are you, Lord? Who are you really to me? I'd like to start a discussion by the, on this question by focusing on the term Lord. Now, it's interesting that Saul posed that question as he did. Who are you, Lord? And he meant that in a term of respect. But in other places in our scripture, it's used to call out the name of God or, or know that it is God who created the heavens and the earth. Now, I mentioned that Saul was not necessarily using that term in reference of God of Jesus here. You see, the, the term Lord or kurios has a few different meanings, according to Strong's Bible Dictionary. It can mean a possessor or an owner, someone who has control of a person. Hmm. Do you ever think of God who had control over Saul at that moment? The term is also used as a title of honor to show respect or reverence. Well, Saul was definitely doing that at the time, wasn't he? He was fell to his knees because, well, he was protecting himself, but he was also crying out to whomever was over him and, and had control of him, so to speak, at this point. Saul was definitely showing that reverence as he was being overwhelmed. But finally, it says that term Lord is used to be giving, given to God or to the Messiah. And as the Lord spoke to him, Saul became fully aware that he was speaking to the crucified Christ, that Messiah. Now, given these definitions, have you ever stopped and wondered for yourself and really think of that question, who are you, Lord? I don't mean just kind of cursory think about it really deeply think about it. Maybe it hasn't been in a question quite in that specific form. Maybe it's been along more the lines of, well, just who is God after all? Or what is God like? Or 
Most importantly, who is God to me? In order for us to witness to God's love and for us, we also have to know who that is that truly loves us deeply and passionately loves us. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been in life, he still loves us. So let's take a moment and look at Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, where it tells us, be still and know that I am God. So if you're comforting, comfortable doing so this morning, take, close your eyes and take a deep breath this morning. Quiet your mind. And let's take a few moments of silent and ask God the question, who are you, Lord? Allow your heart to be open to whatever God reveals to you for that question. Scripture is filled with examples of just who the Lord is and now and how very much God loves us. Revelations 5 verses 11 and 12 talks about the chorus of angels who saw it, that John saw in this vision or dream singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So the Lord is that slaughtered lamb. Jesus loves us so much that he was willing to be slaughtered or sacrificed to pay the price for our sins. And the Psalms have over and over again examples of just who God is and what he's done for us. And if you're following along with our weekly, uh, our daily readings, then you would have read about this this past week in chapter 30. He's our rescuer, our restorer of health, our provider and, and our favor of joy. And, and even in the midst of any turmoils or temporary anger or, or my weeping or my deepest despair, God, you can still provide your favor to me. You can still provide your joy to me. So I encourage you to take some time this week to to read some of those psalms, especially in Psalm 30, who is asking of God, who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me in that reading of the scriptures and ask God that question, who are you to me? And so as we continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord and Savior, and perhaps we too will be in that place where that the disciples were at, in John chapter 21, where Jesus had, had shown himself a couple times and a couple of them been out in the sea and been fishing and someone was calling to them. They couldn't quite make out who it was out there in the distance. But none of the, it says none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. They knew it was Christ Jesus calling to them from the shore. Our witness who his works in our own lives will continue to grow as stronger and stronger as we recognize who he is, as we acknowledge his lordship over our lives, and as we submit to his will for our life. But it all starts with the question that we've raised today. Who are you, Lord? As we prepare to go out into the world today, let's acknowledge his control and ownership over our lives and we submit to him and his will for us and then my challenge for you this week is before you get out of bed each day ask God to reveal who he is for you that day just take a deep breath in the morning before you can get up and as you're stretching as you say God reveal to me who you are and as he does reveal and you listen for him in that moment to get the answers to that question, who are you, Lord? Jot down maybe some of the things you're learning about him. Who are you to me today? And remember that these are revelations with someone, not a nebulous God that's just out there and floating around, and, 
but he's your personal God, your personal Savior. And remember, you were in a personal relationship with him because remember, we are witnesses to how he's been working in our life. And then finally, remember to always praise him as your relationship with him deepens. So we're working on our personal relationship with God and with Jesus this week. Amen. Would you be in a word of prayer with me? Gracious Lord, we hear that question over and over. Who are you, Lord? And sometimes we don't take the time to dig deep within ourselves and question you and ask you to reveal yourself to us. Who are you? And what do you mean to me as being the Lord of my life? And so, Lord, give us the strength and the courage to ask that question today as we ask it over and over again this week. Lord, reveal to me who you are and what you would have me do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join in our hymn of response this morning. It's number 354 in the hymnal or words on the screen, I Surrender All.
time where we collect our tithes and our offerings, and it's not just about the, the money we give, but also things like the food for the food pantry to restock our shelves, and yes, even empty laundry detergent bottles. And you might think that sounds weird, but the uh, uh, food bank in Bloomington was gifted with a bulk 500 gallon of laundry detergent. Well, you can't exactly get that out to people like that, can you? So you need people just to bring in empty laundry detergent bottles so they can fill it from that, that big vat and, and provide it to all the communities around that uh, people would need laundry soap. And you even think, gosh, even God's taken our trash where we normally throw away for recycle uh, uh, entry la empty laundry detergent bottles and he's using that to bless others with. And that's the same way that we do through our service and our actions, even through those simple little things that, gosh, we would have been recycling or throwing out of trash, and that can be used to bless someone else. So let's thank God for all that he does do for us as we sing our doxology this morning. <clears throat> that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we just ask that you take our tithes, our offerings, our gifts for the food pantry, and even our empty laundry detergent bottles, Lord, so that they can be used to show your love and care to those that are in need through the simple acts of us providing care and healing, and especially when combined with other people that are providing these same types of gifts, Lord, that we can be used to, to provide that comfort and peace so that people can finally understand who you are and that you love them very much, just like you love us. So we thank you and praise you, Lord, for these opportunities to respond to your great love to, for us. Amen. Now it's time to lift up our joys and concerns to the Lord. What joys and concerns do you have left up today? Of course, uh, just continue our prayers for the Nord family as uh, Nancy was uh, had her funeral yesterday and um, we're blessed with the beautiful flowers uh, from that uh, celebration of life yesterday as well. Other joys and concerns today? Pray that we got spared from the tornadoes. Thanks that we got spared from the tornadoes, yeah. That was uh, just north of us here up by uh, Colfax uh, that, that got some of that damage, so. So, so, oh, okay. All right. And that was late last night, you said? All right. So now we have a birthday on the 28th, 29th, and 30th of April. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Mom and I will never have a birthday again. It's going to be the same. At least you know your place. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that, that is a joyous thing, you know. 
great grandkids or, or fantastic grandkids are really great because you can wind them up and say, oh, I mean, no, 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 uh, but you already know that. Um, but you know, they're just a joy to have around and brighten our days and brighten our lives. And so we just thank God for those. Other joys and concerns today. That's right. All right, so your granddaughter graduating uh, from Butler next weekend. Yeah, they always pick Mother's Day weekend. I, I guess that's a gift to mothers that they're done with school, right, and moving on to being regular adults now. So shows shows that care and nurturing that you've done and, and moving on to the next phase in life. Yes, ma'am. Next Saturday, you have your first softball game? All right. Any others this morning? All right. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the simple things that even you do for us. Lord, for things like sparing us for tornado damage in our communities to, to great things such as being able to celebrate birthdays and and graduations and yes even birth of new babies and into our lives and also lord there's also other times of celebration when we even though there's sadness involved in, in death Lord, there is great release because we know that our loved ones are home with you, Lord, and they are no longer in pain and suffering and, and restricted by the earthly lives that they had before them. So, Father, we always give you thanks and praise. And, Lord, we just lift up the Nord family to, for them continuing their mourn of Nancy, but also celebrating her life and how she touched everyone's life. And Father, we also give thanks for John and Charlotte's birthdays and, and also for the new grand, uh, great grandson and grandson who were born to Brandon and Emily late yesterday. And Lord, we just ask that you give a blessing to Brandon and Emily as they uh, prepare this new adventure of parenthood. And Father, we also thank you for a great granddaughter that is graduating this next weekend. And Lord, just continue to guide her life and to show her how to be an impact in this world, showing your love to others. And also we rejoice with Bailey over being able to play in our first softball game of the season, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, we just ask that you keep all the kids safe as they play their sports. And Father, you also know all the things that are in our hearts and in our minds that we have not spoken out loud, but we give to you silently now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we join in praying the prayer which your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> and now as we prepare our hearts for our communion this morning, we're reminded that Christ welcomes all to his table of grace who are earnestly seeking a relationship with him, a relationship and, and reconciliation. And we'll prepare our hearts to receive this grace and healing from Jesus as we confess our sins and actions and inactions to him. Would you join me in prayer? God of forgiveness, hear now the confession of our sins, our greed, and our lust for power create enemies where we should find friends. We fail to offer comfort and aid to those who are afraid and beat down by the burdens of life. 
We are as blind and willful as Saul to the pain and destruction of our wrongdoings and our well-meaning crusades. Forgive us, merciful one. Give us sight to see with your eyes that we may bring hope, peace to our world. Amen. Let's be in a moment of silent reflection as we talk to God ourselves. Lord, we thank you and praise you for hearing our prayers and answering them. So hear the good news. God's anger lasts but just a moment, but God's favor lasts for a lifetime. And the Lord forgives our shortcomings and sends deliverance through Jesus Christ, our Lord, just as the Lord forgave Saul and used him to spread the gospel message. Thanks be to God. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, he was having that Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And during that meal, he took the bread, and he raised it to heaven, and he gave thanks. He said, take and eat this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Do this and remember us of me. And after the meal, he took the cup, he lifted it to heaven, and he gave thanks. He said, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you, the new covenant that God has given you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you be in a word of prayer with me? Gracious Lord, we just thank you for your son, Jesus so willingly went to the cross to be our atoning sacrifice so that we know that we are forgiven beyond a shadow of a doubt. We have no doubts whatsoever or reservations that you love us, Lord. And so, Father, we just ask that you transform these gifts of just simple bread and juice, that they may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus, so that we know exactly how much you love us. Amen. In the United Methodist tradition, everyone who is earnestly seeking a relationship with Jesus is welcome to his table. And so if you would uh, like to partake this morning, you're more than welcome to. If you'd like me to bring communion to you in your seat uh, this morning, just let me know and I'll bring it to you. <coughs>
you be in a word of prayer with me? Lord, we just thank you again for the gift of your son, Jesus. And Lord, help us to go out and tell others of how he has worked in our life and made us whole with you so that we too can be witnesses to your great mercy and love. Amen. Let's stand if you're able as we prepare to celebrate our, our sending hymn. It's called The Summons and it's from the Faith We Sing, the Little Black Book in the pews number 2130 or on the screen. Let's receive God's blessings in our tradition. We raise our hands and receive God's blessings because we're getting ready to catch his great things for us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his favor always shine on you. And may you remember to ask the question, who are you, Lord? And listen for the answer and know that he is your personal savior. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.